Good morning, and thank you for being here this morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started at uh, right on the dot. Um, on behalf of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, I am uh, delighted to welcome you here today uh, for this briefing on the PREPARE Act, uh, Preparing for Extreme Weather, Saving Lives, and Taxpayer Money. Uh, we have um, a great panel to look at this issue, which is, uh, and there are, of course, lots of issues around resiliency and emergency preparedness. Um, and today, we are really looking um, at our nation's ability to prepare for and respond to the impacts of extreme weather, uh, especially in terms of um, uh, fiscal uh, responsibility and preparedness. Um, of course, the most, most recent example of uh, a disaster uh, and a, an emergency declaration was in South Carolina. And as you probably know, it's the Stafford Act um, that uh, provides uh, the authority for, dis for federal disaster relief. Uh, Public Law 93-288 amended. Um, and uh, the states need to uh, officially request uh, the president to declare uh, a disaster. So um, the governor uh, needs to, to do this. Um, I think you will probably hear that we have seen many such declarations uh, this year alone, and of course over the last um, several years. So we are, we are facing uh, uh, many emergencies and also um, uh, funding emergencies from, from extreme weather. Uh, we will hear today from uh, Joe Thompson at the Government Accountability Office, GAO, um, uh, about this uh, serious risk to uh, the federal government. Um, put simply, uh, business as usual is no longer sustainable. Uh, we will we will also hear from Andrew Moylan of R Street uh, further about some of these uh, the dangers the uh, and the the risks to the federal government and to taxpayers. Um, and we'll hear from Daniel Green in the middle, uh, who is with uh, Congressman Matt Cartwright from Pennsylvania who introduced the PREPARE Act, uh, largely um, in response to um, a GAO report that um, they call the high risk list that, that Joe will, uh, will discuss. Uh, so I am delighted to first uh, welcome and introduce our first speaker, uh, Joe Thompson, who is uh, <coughs> the Assistant Director of Natural Resources and Environment at GAO. Uh, Joe has a Master of Public Affairs from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Michigan uh, School of Natural Resources and Environment. I will let him tell you about the high-risk list and his role at GAO, um, but I would also like to mention that he, he does have a background also in state and local government, uh, working for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources while in graduate school, and also serving as Ward 1 council member for the town of University Park, Maryland, since 2014. So it is my pleasure to introduce Joe Thompson. Thank you. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you all for being here. Again, I'm Joe Thompson with the Government Accountability Office. And the uh, GAO, of course, is the nonpartisan watchdog of the federal, federal government. So we primarily care about taxpayers and fiscal exposure uh, to um, financial risk from uh, extreme weather events. And one way that we uh, have our work requested is through uh, you know, congressional requests like uh, Congressman Cartwright's office, uh, 
and also mandates through uh, different laws that are passed requiring GAO work. Uh, but one way that we identify uh, particular issues of concern is through both our key issues pages, which are uh, sort of uh, uh, ways that we uh, group information on our website, and also through our high risk list. So we have uh, several issues on our high risk list that relate to uh, fiscal exposure to extreme weather, specifically uh, changes in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather, and also uh, climate-related issues like sea level rise and uh, sort of the slow observed and projected increase of temperatures. And GAO has, again, has a very particular way of looking at this issue. Uh, we care about fiscal exposure to taxpayers, and we have five main lenses that we view that fiscal exposure through. The first is uh, whether the federal government has a strategic plan to deal with uh, observed and projected changes in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather. So what are we trying to do? Who's going to do it? How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to evaluate it? Now, there's been a lot of progress in that area recently with you know, the adaptation plans and various other executive orders. But as a whole, the federal government is still lacking in, in many uh, ways that GAO would evaluate a strategic plan. It's not clear to me what exactly we're trying to accomplish as a whole and how we're going to get there. So that's uh, one area of work that we continue on at GAO. The second is federal government as owner of buildings and lands. <clears throat> so if you look at, say, the Department of Defense, it has over 500,000 facilities with $850 billion in replacement value. We should really care about, a lot about this because some of these facilities, like maybe Navy bases, are at sea level. So we should start thinking long term about how we're going to uh, make sure that these facilities are resilient to changes in extreme weather. Uh, also, we manage 650 million acres of land, out west primarily. Uh, so you talk about national parks, national forests, uh, Bureau of Land Management lands. Um, and uh, you can imagine NASA facilities, one of a kind, the wind tunnels, all sorts of weird things we do at NASA facilities. Pretty interesting stuff. Want to make sure that they're available to the American public going forward. Uh, and GSA buildings. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of other facilities uh, owned and managed by the federal government. So there's a huge fiscal exposure to taxpayers that if we don't uh, consider the fact that the future is going to be different than the past, we're going to be stuck with a big bill. Uh, the third lens that GAO uses is uh, the federal government as insurer of crops and, uh, you know, flood insurance. So I think, I don't know what the exact number is, but the National Flood Insurance Program owes the federal government at least $20 billion right now. The, the program is structurally unsound for a number of other reasons, uh, but, clim uh, you know, extreme weather events and climate-related uh, impacts uh, make that fiscal exposure greater over time. Uh, the fourth lens, and this is really important and sort of a key role of the federal government moving forward, is the provider of technical assistance to state, local, and private sector uh, decision makers. So federal government provides billions of dollars every year to things like roads and bridges and all sorts of other things that are prioritized by state and local governments. Um, so decisions made by these actors affect the long-term fiscal exposure to the federal government. So if we can help these actors make better decisions and make everything that the federal government pays for more resilient, we can reduce federal fiscal exposure over time. And that means tying in projected changes in extreme weather uh, to the planning processes for all these different types of state and local activities. Now, um, the fifth lens that GAO uses is the provider of disaster assistance. So you can imagine, if we don't do a very good job managing facilities, uh, our flood insurance program has problems, we don't provide disaster assistance very well, we don't do a good job with strategic planning, you know, the federal government is also the backstop as far as disaster assistance. And we don't budget for disaster assistance. So almost all the money we spend on that is borrowed. And that gets to a, a key point here, is that this is a systematic problem, that everything that the federal government does is affected by changes in extreme weather in one way or another, and we don't account for it in a very systematic way. And I have kind of a simple way of thinking about this um, as a homeowner. Um, you, know, you can either control your future or you can be controlled by the future. And I look at it um, like I just bought a house not too long ago, right? So it had a very old heating and air conditioning system. So one way to look at it is 
well, I can let it ride, you know, get as much out of it as I can and let the thing break and then replace it, right? Um, unfortunately, that's a really bad idea because inevitably the system's going to break whether it's really hot or really cold outside. There's going to be a whole bunch of other people trying to replace their systems at the same time. I won't have any time to figure out how to actually do it right. I won't have the right time to, to size it, and I'm going to pay twice as much. It would make much more sense for me to save up, decide what I want to do, pick the right system, and invest appropriately up front instead of waiting for the bad thing to happen. So control your future or be controlled by the future. That's what we're really talking about here. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a systems problem that is endemic to lots of things across the federal government. And uh, I'm happy that the GAO is actually taking a stab at trying to address many of these, these issues. We have lots of work underway that I can talk about in more detail later. But with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Joe. And please uh, know that we will look forward to your questions uh, at the end of the presentations. Usually, uh, so that would be about 11:30, and that'll that'll be very important to get your input as well. We're trying to beat that this time. <laughs> That's right. We're doing well. The questions are the fun part. They are indeed. Um, I, I neglected to introduce myself. I'm Ellen Vaughn with EESI, and I uh, focus on our buildings program. And so one of, I, I wanted just to mention that there's a lot of good news in that there are so many uh, incredibly uh, important initiatives underway, um, very good uh, practices, best practices for building resilient, sustainable buildings, not the least of which are building codes, which should be adopted by every state. Uh, so I, I did want to mention that. Um, today, though, as, 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 we're, as we're saying, this really is, um, we're zeroing in on this fiscal exposure. And um, I am delighted to now introduce Daniel Green who is an um, energy and environment legislative fellow with Congressman Matt Cartwright from Pennsylvania. Um, <clears throat> and just to mention that, um, as many of you realize, this is a, a recess week, and uh, Mr. Cartwright is um, uh, in his district. And I, I wanted to give a shout out to Jeremy Marcus, who um, uh, has been great to work with also on, on staff. Um, the congressman is on the House, uh, serves on the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, and also is a member of the House Committee on Natural Resources. Um, so Daniel is um, is helping out on on the Prepare Act, among um, other issues. Daniel is a senior public was a, a senior public affairs advisor at Warwick Group uh, Consultants prior to um, coming on to the. Uh, to Mr. Cartwright's staff. Uh, and he worked with municipal and county clients. Uh, he also developed and advocated uh, for legislation to improve flood risk management practices and interagency coordination. Uh, Daniel was also a senior consultant at Alden Street Consulting. Uh, and he assisted the US Army Corps of Engineers in developing a more efficient project delivery strategy alternative financing methods, and public-private partnership models for water resource projects. So obviously well qualified to talk about um, uh, preparing and what the PREPARE Act uh, can, can deliver on some of those points that Joe raised. So I'm very happy to introduce Daniel Green. Perfect. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for uh, attending. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Ellen and EESI, for facilitating this great briefing. We really appreciate it. Um, Congressman certainly does as well. Uh, Congressman Carwright has grave concerns about the nation's extreme weather resilience and preparedness, as highlighted by the GAO's high-risk reports findings. As Joe just alluded to, the federal government is not adequately addressing the nation's extreme weather vulnerabilities which substantially increases the federal government's financial risks and endangers the public, our critical infrastructure, and our precious environment. As you all know, extreme weather events threaten many economic and environmental systems, including agriculture, infrastructure, ecosystems, and human health, 
and present a significant financial risk to the federal government. In the past four years alone, there were 253 presidential major disaster declarations. 42 of these major disaster declarations caused $227 billion of economic losses and 1,286 fatalities. Of course, all of our districts are vulnerable to extreme weather events, from the devastating droughts in the Southwest to the hurricane-prone Atlantic and Gulf Coast, to the tornadoes in the heartland, and to the catastrophic wildfires in the Northwest. Every representative's district faces extreme weather threats. And even when your district is not directly impacted by an extreme weather event, your constituents frequently pay for the disaster response and cleanup anyways. For example, the federal government provided about $60 billion towards federal recovery efforts in the Mid-Atlantic region following Superstorm Sandy. That money came from constituents in every single district. The GAO highlighted a couple specific issues with the federal government's resilience and preparedness efforts. First and foremost, there's not efficient sharing of information, data, and best practices amongst federal agencies. There's not proper coordination amongst regional branches of the federal government to prepare for disaster and extreme weather events. Uh, some agencies simply aren't adequately incorporating resilience and preparedness into their agency pre planning processes. So uh, we must take every step necessary to curb the federal government's financial risk and protect the public. Remember, for every $1 we spend on disaster preparedness and resilience, the American taxpayer saves about $4 in disaster recovery, cleanup, and economic savings. And of course, we can prevent devastating tragedies that ruin the livelihoods of thousands of Americans each year if we plan better. That's why Congressman Cartwright and Congressman Lance have reintroduced the Bipartisan Prepare Act. The PREPARE Act will protect our nation's assets and citizens from the enormous risks, po risks posed by extreme weather events by increasing the government's disaster planning and preparedness at no cost to the taxpayer. This bill has four key components. First, the PREPARE Act codifies an interagency council, which will encourage federal agencies to share best practices and information on extreme weather and preparedness and resilience. Second, the PREPARE Act creates an oversight and governance structure and a process that requires agencies to implement government-wide resilience, preparedness, and risk management priorities. Third, the PREPARE Act directs federal the federal government to work with local and state planners to identify regional issues, facilitating the adoption of resilience, preparedness, and risk management best practices. Fourth, the PREPARE Act establishes a regional coordination plan to ensure greater coordination among the many regional efforts. Most importantly, this bill does not cost a dime. We are simply encouraging agencies to incorporate extreme weather and preparedness and resilience into their agency planning and project delivery processes. We worked extensively with the GAO, private sector experts, and the administration to craft a very straightforward, effective, and frankly, common sense bill also, we're very pleased to enjoy broad bipartisan support from both Republican and Democratic offices. We're also happy to have 49 endorsing organizations, including private companies, conservative think tanks, the insurance industry, and environmental organizations. Of course, we have our friends from R Street and the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, in fact, a few weeks ago, the PREPARE Act was included in the National Taxpayer Union's annual Top 10 Bipartisan No-Brainers list, which includes, quote, straightforward measures that should not invite fierce ideological debate, but saves taxpayers money and makes the government more efficient, end quote. I thank you all for attending this briefing. This bill is extremely important to, to us and is certainly something that should be important to all members' offices. Extreme weather affects every single district. We must make sure that the federal government is taking every step necessary to adequately plan and incorporate resilience into their agency missions. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So it sounds easy, coordinate, but we know how difficult that is. And I can think of several agency initiatives. Um, and there, there is a lot going on. I'm sure you know. It can be sort of overwhelming. Lots of work on uh, resiliency. Um, but I'm not sure how much communication between 
the agencies there is. So that would be one thing I certainly would like to see. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Moylan, who is executive director of R Street Institute, and um, also uh, focusing on uh, taxpayer uh, issues and fiscal responsibility. Uh, Andrew uh, also is the lead voice on the organization's uh, tax issues. Prior to joining R Street, he was vice president of government affairs for the National Taxpayers Union, uh, a grassroots taxpayer advocacy organization. Previously with the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute and uh, completed internships in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives with members from his home state of Michigan. Andrew's writings have appeared in uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Weekly Standard. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan with a degree in political science. And Andrew, I'm delighted to welcome you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Ellen, and, and thank you to EESI for the kind invitation. I didn't realize until today uh, just now, Joe, that I have another University of Michigan grad uh, here. Do we have any Ohio State folks in the audience? Okay, good. I'm going to tell my favorite Ohio State joke. Maybe two. Um, so uh, what happens if you drive through Columbus, Ohio too slowly? They give you a degree from Ohio State. Um, one more football related, which I can return to making football jokes because Michigan's actually good this year. Uh, how many Ohio State football players does it take to screw in a light bulb? Just one, but he gets $2,500 cash under the table and four credit hours to do it. Um, so uh, let, let me give you a, a brief background about what the R Street Institute is. Uh, who am I? Why am I here? So the R Street Institute is a free market think tank. Uh, we are based here in Washington, D.C., but we have uh, state and regional offices as well in, uh, I guess, six places around the country. Uh, and we do a tremendous amount of work on natural disaster preparedness, response issues, uh, and the intersection with, with public policy. There are a couple of areas that have been a big focus for us. Uh, one which you've heard mentioned a few times already is the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, much of our, the, the sort of genesis of our organization and our expertise as an organization uh, ties back to insurance issues. And so we have for many years worked on, uh, in some cases it feels like banging our heads against a wall, but attempting to reform the National Flood Insurance Program uh, to address the, the debt that we've heard about from folks, uh, to address the uh, misaligned incentives in the program. Uh, we've also done work on, on other issues, though, on, uh, for example, earthquake risk uh, in the state of California, which is, uh, you know, one of these sort of, we, we, everybody knows about flood risk because it happens all the time. Everybody knows about hurricane risk because it happens all the time. Uh, earthquake risk sort of recedes to the background when we don't have major events, and yet that's a, a huge, huge issue, particularly in places like California and, and others on the West Coast. Uh, We've, we've started looking into wildfire issues and trying to figure out how we can uh, align policy to better protect ourselves from uh, wildfire risk. Uh, we've also worked on trying to encourage uh, what are essentially subsidy-free zones in coastal areas uh, in the country and uh, the Coastal Barrier Resources System, if people are familiar with it. And we think that this is a common sense way uh, a, a, a from from our perspective, consistent with free markets and limited government and our sort of conservative libertarian principles, uh, that one of the first steps we should take is to stop subsidizing behavior uh, that makes the problem worse, that makes the problems for taxpayers worse, uh, and that makes risks for humans worse. Um, and so the sort of unifying theme of that work is reducing costs for taxpayers. We've spent you know, nearly half a trillion dollars on, uh, on hazard damages since 1988, uh, much of which, of course, comes back to taxpayers. The National Flood Insurance Program, the last I checked, the number is about $23 billion, uh, if we want to put some more precision on it. The National Flood Insurance Program is in debt to taxpayers uh, to that degree. We want to reduce the human toll. Uh, of natural disasters. So I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have been plucked off of a roof uh, to escape from floodwaters? Nobody. Good. Okay. We'd like to keep it that way. Uh, 
uh, because that is, of course, extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, and we have, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a policy infrastructure that does not do enough to, one, uh, uh, tell people honestly what risks they face to live in certain areas, uh, and two, that when disasters do happen, that hamper our ability to respond to those in effective ways so that we don't have to pluck people off of a roof in a helicopter. Uh, and we've seen, of course, the tremendous human toll that major flooding events, major storm events can have. And the last thing that, that we want to do is we want to enhance the role of private markets, of private actors uh, in helping to respond to, to disaster uh, and, and to mitigate disaster risk. And so uh, for us, you know, that's been the, the crux of a lot of our work on the National Flood Insurance Program, for example, is trying to introduce uh, risk-based rates uh, so that people understand the risk that they face uh, to live in, in places that they live. And so to us, the PREPARE Act is a, a very simple bit of common sense uh, to try to better coordinate our federal and state resources uh, as it relates to disaster preparedness and response. And so, as Daniel mentioned, there is no significant cost to taxpayers. Uh, frankly, even if there were a significant cost to taxpayers, I'd be happy to serve you up uh, you know, some offsets that I think we could do without. I've spent years identifying trillions of dollars worth of uh, what at least I regard as waste, inefficiency, fraud, abuse uh, in federal spending, and those resources would be much better spent uh, on efforts like this. I always say that one of the reasons that I'm such a passionate believer in limited government is precisely because I think we don't spend enough on the stuff that matters and that is an appropriate role for federal or state or local governments. Uh, and so, you know, even if there were a cost, I think that we should still be having this conversation. Um, and so some simple reorganizations uh, that are embodied in the PREPARE Act can, I think, help improve our response. And I, I would point out one thing that, you know, perhaps we'll, we'll walk through in some more detail in, in the questions, uh, what the, the structure of the bill is. But the third title of it, uh, which Daniel alluded to, uh, creating an, an inventory of regional uh, disaster response agencies uh, and, and creating a function for those people to meet and communicate with one another is something that I think is important because we have uh, one thing that we struggle with in government is having an inventory of anything uh, and, and having an ability to understand who the appropriate responding agencies are having a communication function for them so that they can help to coordinate response over wide regions uh, is something that makes a tremendous amount of sense. It's not something that we do well enough today, and it's something that the PREPARE Act uh, would improve our ability to do. And so uh, so we, we have sort of spearheaded uh, the you know, conservative response and outreach on this. Uh, you saw outside a, a copy of a coalition letter that we organized with several of our conservative allies. Uh, that agree that this is a common sense step that uh, that we think is consistent with our principles and and uh, something that we think is uh, is tremendously important. And so we commend you and your boss for your work on that. Um, and with that, I guess we'll uh, I'll turn it over to you and we'll get to questions. Great. Andrew, thank you so much for that. Uh, and I think definitely teed up some, some important issues, um, all three of you did. Uh, and I would like to, to open it up for questions, and I would encourage um, you to be brave and <laughs> curious, and uh, I certainly have some, but I don't want to hog the floor. So, so please, uh, yes. Hi, my name is Yael. I'm with the American Meteorological Society Policy Program. I've got a question, actually, just for a little more background on one of the specific things I see in the summary of the bill, um, is that the, the website to facilitate, among other things, um, the identification and interpretation of the best available meteorological science. Could you go into a little background about why that's in there and, and just a little bit about that? Sure. Can you hear me? So, all right. so uh, I encourage you to first look at the bill from a broader perspective. I think we, we highlight specific data sets and information that other agencies have requested and think would be valuable 
in uh, improving their resilience and preparedness. Uh, one of those was meteorolog meteor meteorological data. Uh, so that's why that's been specifically identified, though we're certainly encouraging them to share any pertinent data related to disaster resilience and preparedness. Uh, if that makes sense, does that address your question? Yeah, so how does it interact with the role of the National Weather Service in providing? All right, um, I can provide a little bit of perspective from GAO and some of our work. Uh, almost every report we've done related to this realm uh, ends up with the same question <laughs> from different types of decision makers. It's like, you want what do you want me to be resilient to? And where do I get the information? So there's lots of different sources of information right now, and it's very confusing to anybody who's not an expert uh, in these particular topics. So I think, uh, you know, that aspect of the bill uh, relates to a lot of the findings in GAO's reports about how do you better uh, collect and share information. Yes, sir. Um, Nick Barbash, Senator Kane's office. Um, two related questions. Um, number one, how uh, have, how closely have you been following um, uh, efforts that are underway in uh, in various regions uh, with vulnerability to um, uh, to sea level rise? Um, uh, places like the Gulf Institute in the New Orleans area and the uh, the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. There, um, we're, we're looking at something similar in Hampton Roads, Virginia. So I was curious how you. How, you, how effective you see those regional programs being. Um, and then the second was uh, th this sort of whole of government issue is something that we've been following closely given the number of, of agencies involved in this. Um, you know, there's you know, at, at least a dozen federal agencies that, f that look at resilience issues, um, but, but no one for whom it's kind of the, the you know, the, who has leadership uh, uh, authority um, and just in looking at this bill uh, looks like it sets up a interagency council um, just devil's advocate I mean isn't that just adding another cook in, uh, in an uh, already fairly crowded kitchen sure. yeah I'd, I'd be happy to certainly address the uh, last one uh, the GAO high-risk report identified that yeah, there are some federal government agencies that are are doing fairly well with disaster resilience and preparedness incorporating that into their mission over some agencies just aren't taking it seriously and uh, aren't as effective as, as they probably should be. Uh, so this bill, in essence, will set up a forum for the 12 or so, as you identified, federal government agencies that have a mission to, to prepare and incorporate resilience into their project delivery strategies to work with other agencies and work <laughs> amongst themselves to share data, information, and best practices to ensure that every agency is able to make more informed and, and evidence-based decisions. So while there's some agencies that are doing well, some are not, and even the agencies that are doing well could probably be better informed by up-to-date data and collaborating amongst different agencies. So that just simply establishes a form in which they can share information and best practices. Um, would you like to speak to the first? Uh, GAO hasn't evaluated those specific programs, so I can't really speak to those. Um, but you know, the federal government does have a lot of things underway. And a lot of them are making a big difference within agencies, you know, the executive orders and the adaptation plans and everything else. Um, but most of what's underway now is based on executive orders. So as soon as this administration leaves, they may or may not be continued. I think what this bill does is uh, at least sort of cements in place some of the uh, coordination functions that are in place right now across the federal government. So is it ideal, um, you know, with the way that federal agencies are organized now, this is uh, a reasonable approach, I think. And this is just me speaking as me, not as GAO. <coughs> Andrew? So on the, on the cooks in the kitchen question, I think that's a good one. Um, I'm going to give you possibly the world's most trivial example uh, that I think explains at, at least our perspective on this, which is... Uh, so at, at the R Street Institute, we have to, you know, when we get a grant from a private foundation, uh, we have certain tracking responsibilities, we have, you know, certain goals, whatever. Uh, and we don't have a single, well, we didn't until recently have a single person uh, 
whose primary responsibility it was to track that. And so it was a kind of secondary or tertiary responsibility for a half a dozen people or more, whoever's uh, operating on a, on a given project area. And as a result, you have this very sort of tenuous grasp on, on uh, reporting in the first place and making sure that you're getting it all in one place and uh, and making you know reports on time and, and doing that kind of thing. I mean, this is trivial stuff, but what the the action that that we've taken is to you know have somebody who has primary responsibility to do that kind of grant tracking. It's been helpful in coordinating it um, to sort of extend that that analogy of of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, you know, any major restaurant is going to have you know, a, a bunch of cooks in the kitchen, but they're also going to have an executive chef. And the executive chef is there to make sure that everybody's operating uh, toward whatever the common goal is, to get the plate out on time and to make sure that it's right. Uh, and, and absent that sort of coordinating uh, uh, function, you know, there's, there's a, uh, uh, some measure of chaos that's possible. And I think that the evidence suggests that there is a significant degree of chaos in uh, the federal government in particular, but also state and regional agencies uh, in their disa disaster preparedness and response. And so this is sort of a, a simple common sense way uh, to help coordinate those entities. And I don't think there's a lot of drawback to it. it it's, you're, not, you're not creating a tremendous number of, uh, for, you know, for example, you're not creating a, a huge new agency uh, you know, with uh, huge amounts of staff, that sort of thing that would, would concern me. Um, so there's, to, to me, there's not a lot of drawback to it, and there's a lot of potential upside to having a, an improved coordination function. Fred. Thanks. Um, coming back to a comment that uh, Ellen made mentioning building codes, um, the, there are uh, the vocabulary of resilience and all the associated terms has been evolving over time and uh, dialing back to the days of mitigation and disaster risk reduction, looking at the pre-disaster measures that may be taken, like risk-based premiums. Um, <clears throat> to what extent does the PREPARE Act address effectively um, disaster risk reduction? And to what extent does it support the functions of building and land use regulation, which have proven effective in the case of many other hazards. And what's the attitude of R Street toward regulatory efforts related to building and land use? Well, I can tell you that uh, we are certainly skeptical of the notion of, of any kind of federal uh, building code. Uh, that said, I think that there are some things that can be done that are consistent uh, to encourage states to do uh, you know better Prepare, preparation, better planning. Uh, you know, we've we've toyed around with the idea. Ellen mentioned the Stafford Act. Uh, we've toyed around with the idea of having a, essentially a sliding scale of reimbursement uh, for states as a, uh, for disaster payments, uh, in order to help encourage them to take actions ahead of time to reduce their risks, to understand the risks that they face. Um, and so while I'm skeptical of any sort of single federal response that establishes a, a single code, uh, I think that there are some related efforts that you could do that, uh, that help get to the same goal without some of the same challenges. Um, and so I, and I'll, I'll let the others respond to the first part of the question about uh, what does this do to essentially reduce disaster you know, exposure uh, in the first place. And, um, I would say that no single bill can address the panoply of issues that we face as it relates to disaster risk. Um, you know, this this bill is targeted at one component of it. There are many other components which a lot of us work on. But um, you know, to me, that's that's part of the appeal of this bill is that it's a single sort of channel, uh, which I think is a relatively easy case to make. And you know, taking those sort of small bites. Uh, is an important way to get to the ultimate goal uh, rather than creating one big giant comprehensive framework which everybody's going to have you know some complaint with here or there that this is an easy part that you can uh, move the ball on right um, and in, in regard to the the building in land use uh, the prepare act will ensure that the federal governments the state governments and the local governments have the adequate data and uh, best practices to make better 
building and land use uh, decisions. But I think that in, in, in doing so will help decrease our disaster exposure. Just ensuring that the federal government is, is, is sharing best practices effectively amongst themselves, sharing data, sharing information, ensuring everyone is well informed as possible to make evidence-based decisions in order to better incorporate resilience and disaster preparedness and extreme weather preparedness into their agency mission so we're not caught off guard by these disaster events. So everyone knows what, what's vulnerable, how can we curb that vulnerability, and thus in doing so we should decrease our disaster exposure and fiscal exposure. And I might add, to Fred's good question, um, is the private sector, the Interagency Council, is there sort of a private sector component, or do you imagine that would be part of it, uh, state, local, and private sector participants? Right. There's So the Interagency Council is, is just established in order to ensure that agencies are able to share amongst themselves. We do have a separate component of the bill that ensures there's regional collaboration amongst state, local, and federal governments, and um, uh, that should address some of those concerns. Uh, I think it's, Joe, did you want to say anything or not about, um, about that? I don't have a whole lot to add other than to say that uh, we have some studies underway related to uh, resilience and design standards and building codes. So we'll uh, be in touch in a year or so. And, and I think that, um, and that's what I was, I mean, it, it, to your point about, is it just another council? The reason I think, this is my opinion, that we see, so we have seen bills so many times suggest an interagency council is because we need that, but it's hard to do. Um, but just to give you an example, um, <clears throat> let me just take buildings, since that's my area. Um, I know that Department of Homeland Security has a pilot program called Resiliency Star, uh, right, for residential, looking at applying um, the fortified home standard, which is a sort of a beyond, above code uh, uh, practice to, to enhance durability, resiliency. Um, and so that's happening. And then there's the Department of Energy um, that is, is uh, um, for example, has a zero energy ready homes program. And one, I, one thing I think is important to look at is it's not, I mean, for buildings, there are so many things that we, we want and need for buildings, so many things um, that, uh, that different experts in different agencies, even with resources, provide. So not only do we not want our buildings to fall down uh, and catch fire, which our building codes uh, ensure, and we want them to have a certain minimum efficiency based on what's available and cost-effective energy codes, um, <clears throat> but if we can apply what we know about energy efficiency and even um, using renewable energy so that, uh, the, that uh, your house can be, um, for example, uh, more comfortable if, if there's a power outage, you, it's still gonna be comfortable because it's so energy efficient. Um, perhaps you have um, renewable energy so that you can, you can continue operations even, with, even during a power outage. Those are very different things. The National Institute of Standards and Technology is looking at um, what it does with metrics and standards so that there's some consistency. Um, HUD, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, with, uh, with help from Rockefeller Foundation, established um, a competition called Resilient by Design and got the best minds in, in land use and, and building design to have some input as to um, what can we do differently so that this doesn't happen again? So they're just. So I think that uh, having having the private sector and the federal government coordinate. There's there's so many opportunities. The National Institute of Building Sciences has done a lot of work on resiliency. So there are some lots of resources to bring to bear, but we need better systems, better organization. Um, and that would be just 
to give it a little more, sometimes concrete examples can help. My name is David Haddis. I'm with the Institute for Building Technology and Safety. And my question will relate to the third bullet on the presentation that you had up there, which was to encourage the federal government to work with states and local agencies to promote uh, regional approaches to resiliency. And it ties into what Ellen just mentioned, the NDRC, the National Disaster Resilience Competition, which, which are due to HUD in two weeks. Uh, uh, both Dr. Krimgold and I participated uh, in some of the Rockefeller Foundation efforts to advance that program. And that program indeed uh, had a major objective of breaking down the silos, both at the federal level and at the state and local level, uh, that, that uh, typify the response to disasters. Uh, what we have found is that some states did a better job than others. Uh, some states really were able to collaborate and bring everybody to work together. And some said, this is a HUD program, so uh, we're emergency managers. We're not involved in that. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, GAO just released a very excellent report evaluating the Sandy uh, recovery efforts. And it did talk a lot about issues of resiliency. In fact, I think it was the focus. Will there be an effort to, to try to harvest the lessons learned from NDRC? It'll be a while, because they're going to make the awards in another six months or so. But it, it'll be a ripe field to look at how to break down the silos at the state and local level as well? And what can the federal government do? I'm, the question is, will GAO be taking a look at that? Yes, there's money involved. We'll be taking a look at it. <laughs> That's the simplest answer. I think uh, in, in a real general sense, um, most of our work in this area is trying to change the conversation from how do we respond to disasters to how do we plan for the likelihood that disasters are going to happen and how we budget for it. We need to get this stuff on the books and understand that um, you know, it's something that we need to be prepared for. And uh, I, I think our bill sets the, establishes a framework, the regional councils in which these folks can incorporate better practices as, as found, whether it's from the GAO or from the uh, NRDC, I believe you said, uh, some of those findings. So this, this establishes the framework that these folks need to better collaborate and how they actually collaborate and break down these silos is somewhat up to their it, contingent on each region, what, what works best for that specific region and those unique subsets of states and local governments and whatnot. We were just chatting before the briefing about sometimes there are conflicting requirements and regulations. And uh, the example that came up the other day was how um, you know trees, this was the US Forest Service, and trees can, of course, have many, many benefits. Um, and can, they can be dangerous with extreme weather, but they can also aid in um, uh, you know, cooling and the, or mitigating the urban heat island effect in extreme weather, so many things like that. But they can also, block the sun so that you don't have solar access if you want to put solar panels on your house. So those things um, really do come right down to the local level. And, um, and that's the challenge, I think, uh, when, we, when we get to implementing these, we have to, you know, that communication has to be um, at, at all levels. Other questions? Hello, my name is Miranda Peterson and I work at the Center for American Progress. Um, we've written on this subject quite a bit and we're big fans of the bill. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in our, when looking at resilient spending throughout the federal government 
is the difficulty of sometimes dividing the resilience budget, the extreme weather resilience budget, from the rest of the budget as a whole. What can be resilience for one community, um, say a hard infrastructure, gray infrastructure, building a seawall, et cetera, um, <coughs> rates for one community, but for another community, it may be um, green infrastructure or parks, more trees to absorb all that flood water. For another community, say a defense community, resilience to extreme weather might also rate as um, an anti-terrorism effort. Or perhaps for certain low-income communities, extreme weather resilience is also their economic resilience, which can rate as nutrition assistance. Mm -hmm. So, um, and oftentimes this can be very difficult because there seems to be a larger effort to bake resilience into the budget as a whole. Um, which is certainly why we should know how much we're spending on it um, and how much we're also saving taxpayers across the country. So do you have any perspective on how exactly um, government agencies, communities, states might um, be able to analyze and look at where the dividing line is, what counts as resilience and what does not? Thank you. So uh, just uh, a Quickly on that, I think um, you raise a, an interesting point that, and this is a challenge that we see in every piece of legislation ever, essentially, is, is uh, how do you have appropriate definitions uh, that, that allow you to account for, for resources? And everybody's going to have you know, a different application for some funding stream than somebody else. And I'll give you an example of another uh, issue that we've worked on is the Restore Act. So after the BP oil spill uh, in the Gulf, Congress passed the Restore Act that says that any fines that were associated with the BP spill would be divided up among the, the affected states, and the affected states are supposed to use those funds uh, for environmental and economic restoration projects. Uh, you could argue that Congress was insufficiently precise in exactly how they defined what environmental and, and economic restoration projects would be. And so we've been engaged uh, in the Gulf Coast. Our, our southern region director who's based in Alabama has been working to try to make sure that uh, basically that states don't do crazy things with the dollars, that there have been some who say, well, let's, you know, let's economic restoration, let's uh, spend this money on, on a baseball stadium. Uh, and it, it seems pretty clear to me that that's not the intent of Congress in, uh, in diverting these funds to state governments for environmental and economic restoration. So um, it's, in a way, sort of a non-answer to your question. It is, it's more a nod of the head to say, yes, that is a challenge. Um, I don't know that there's, and Daniel can speak to, you know, if he thinks that there's a, a, a bigger nexus with this bill in particular, it seems to me that that's a challenge that's litigated elsewhere uh, in the authorization process, in the appropriations process, and guidance that's given uh, to and by executive agencies. Um, and it, it's not to say that it's not a challenge, it is. Um, but it's, it's in a sense, uh, you know, sort of an elsewhere challenge. Yeah, great. And I, I do think that's a, it's a great question. I think it's a little bit somewhat outside the scope of, of what we, we try to address in the PREPARE Act. And I can see that there are some, there's some value perhaps to um, dividing resilience from the, from the regular budget, or at least se se separating it out to, to better analyze and assess it. But from our perspective, uh, from a planning and project delivery perspective, we, we think that resilience should be incorporated into all these various missions and agency missions in order to ensure that when agencies are planning or delivering projects, they are thinking about how can we best protect this asset or this service from extreme weather events. In doing so, that should curb the risk. That's more of where we're going in terms of the budgetary stuff. It's, it's not really... A, within the scope of the, the bill. It's a good question, though. Very interesting. Yes, you've, uh, you've stumbled onto one of the unanswerable questions. Um, and the reason I say that, I mean, there's a couple different ways to look at how you would break out resilience funding in general. Uh, the, one, the way that the federal government's approaching the issue right now is by building, uh, you know, what do you want me to be resilient to into every federal program? 
right? So we have programs designed to do specific things under specific circumstances. Agencies are recognizing that those circumstances are changing and they're trying to build the new circumstances into how they do business on an everyday basis. If you look at the problem from that perspective, you're not gonna be able to get a, a real good idea of how much you spend on resilience, right? And that's probably okay. You shouldn't want to actually get that number because that means you're building it into everything right now. Now, it's probably not very satisfying and it's not terribly satisfying for me either. And it gets back to my strategic planning point. What are we actually trying to accomplish as a federal government? It's good that we're, you know, mainstreaming resilience into everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's some things that the federal government needs to do that other people can't do. And that's where it's, if you don't have a clear vision and you don't have some clear pots of money to do the federal government things that nobody else can do, mm -hmm. then you're not going to have a dollar value for that. And if you had a strategic plan saying the federal government's going to do, do this specific thing, then you'd be able to track it. But we don't have that. So that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, good responses and really good question. And I was thinking back on something Andrew said about this bill being a first step, an important step, narrow in scope. And then to Joe's point, uh, we, yes, there, there are things that the federal government owns and controls and is responsible for, and those are, uh, that, that's sort of the, the first line of, line of defense or the first uh, goal, perhaps. But then to your, to your point of the, the question, there are also things at the state and local level that need to be determined. And it, to me, it comes back to wanting to have that dialogue, have people involved in the process. For example, uh, low-income communities, advocates, so that everybody can be asked the question, what does resilience mean to you? What, what do you need? And I think you'll get lots of different answers. And, Perhaps that's a way, and I'm thinking out loud, I apologize, but that's a way to at least get these issues on the table and find out where those possible conflicts can come in and what the pie is and what the needs are before you start slicing it up. It might be an example of not wanting to be too prescriptive at the federal level. So but thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How will it relate to like FEMA response? Because um, I'm a first responder in the state of New York, and um, I know when big things and when big incidents happen, FEMA comes in with um, integrated response, and their leadership levels go down to you know state, county, town levels. Um, how will how will that? I feel like this could possibly. Um, when they decide to, they need to have FEMA needs a response, right? Can this any way be integrated into that, um, so they know what tools they like? Um, I would just, I didn't see it on here, FEMA, but how will you know when they work with the state and local planning to facilitate um, the preparedness? Will this be able to go into FEMA at all? The act at all? It's, it's, FEMA will certainly play a part. Um, in sharing best practices to state and local governments to ensure that they are as prepared as possible. Of course, FEMA is somewhat the uh, disaster response or entity of last resort. So ensuring that we have robust state and local policies, whether it's evacuation plans or whatnot, can certainly play a valuable role, as well as coordinating with other agencies. Uh, Department of Transportation, what is it going to look like if there's this sort of flooding in this area, what roads are going to wash out so we know immediately after the disaster, this is where we can access? Some, 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 I'm not saying that's what they'll do, but it's, it's some of the kind of information sharing that would be helpful in knowing who's working at the other agency, what they're doing, what their best practices are, what their vulnerabilities are, how we can best mitigate it. So in that sense, I could see FEMA being a huge beneficiary to other agencies, but also it will help them in their ultimate agency missions, which is to, to better protect the public and, and to respond to these disasters. And I'm hopeful there are some lessons learned that we can draw from, from Katrina, from Sandy, from many places. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, 
it's, is this a first, Amory, for us to end early? <laughs> but this has been great. Uh, thank you so much for coming and for your terrific questions. And uh, if you think of more, feel free to send them in. We'll also have information on our website summaries um, uh, of, of the briefing. And uh, I want to thank our panel very, very much for your, for your input, for your Yes, Daniel. Yeah, if I may, I just want to thank everyone on behalf of Congressman Carright for uh, attending this briefing. I hope it was uh, informative. Of course, if you work for a member, we encourage you to run this up the chain, and I'm more than happy to answer any uh, district-specific questions. If you're an organization, you're interested in learning more, uh, we love talking about this bill. It's very important for us in, in the country. And of course, I thank you guys very, very much, J.O., R Street. Uh, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, appreciate all the great questions and um, the great efforts uh, that Congressman Cartwright has, has put into this and you guys as well. So thanks. Thank you all.